All right, thank you very much. I'll try to keep my remarks brief and to the point. I'm going to talk about uh, bringing climate uh, change to the local scale where we experience it. So I won't discuss global mean temperatures as we've heard uh, so much about, but I'm going to talk about uh, climate, uh, where we live <coughs> at the local scale. And I'll focus on one particular topic uh, which I feel is very important um, so that uh, our climate skeptics are, um, uh, you know, not, not able to carry the day, and that is uh, recognizing <clears throat> the role of uh, internal variability of the climate system, and I will describe what I mean by that. So we can think about uh, uh, temperature at a particular location, let's say Snow Mountain Ranch. And if this is the record of temperature through time, uh, we expect ups and downs just due to uh, the natural variability that our climate system produces because it is a uh, chaotic system. So we'll have periods of warming and periods of cooling, much like uh, we've seen in earlier talks. And then uh, you can think of the forced uh, climate change signal uh, as being kind of the background, uh, sig uh, background slowly evolving um, change through time of uh, temperatures here at Snow Mountain Ranch. And of course, the uh, relative magnitude of this uh, human-induced climate change relative to the free climate variability, free meaning uh, the variability that exists without any changes uh, to greenhouse gases, for example. Uh, the relative magnitudes and time scales, of course, depends on your location and it depends on what you're uh, uh, interested in. So, for example, Arctic sea ice, we know, has declined precipitously. Uh, this last September, we set a record minimum. The ice was only about 50% uh, cover uh, compared to its long-term average. So the blue curve for Arctic sea ice is relatively steep compared to the red curves, uh, red, uh, the fluctuations in the, in the red. Uh, you can think about the deep ocean temperatures, a much more sluggish system. And uh, for that, um, the, the oscillations in temperature may be, more, uh, sl may be slower, uh, maybe on the order of 50 years or so. And the blue curve would be uh, uh, resultingly uh, less, less uh, steep uh, for that situation. So, very important, where do these uh, unforced, or I like to call them free uh, variations in our climate system come, come from? And they come from uh, interactions, uh, uh, the totality of interactions among the atmosphere, the ocean, the cryosphere, uh, and the uh, uh, land uh, system. And um, you can think of these as being spontaneously generated. This is the butterfly effect. Uh, you can, uh, uh, the system is chaotic enough that it can set us onto a different course for some period of time just because of the complexity of interactions among these uh, components of the system. And uh, let me just give you an example of, of uh, the more slowly evolving um, uh, very variations that we actually observe uh, in our climate system. And these are primarily ocean and atmosphere uh, coupling, uh, induced by the coupling between the ocean and the atmosphere. So here are two prominent uh, examples that we have, that we have measured over the last hundred years from our, uh, the ships that go out and measure the ocean temperatures. Uh, the example on the left is uh, the, the uh, history of temper uh, ocean temperatures in the North Atlantic, and this is linked to a, a deep, slowly changing uh, circulation, uh, the conveyor belt or the thermohaline circulation. And it goes up, uh, it has periods of warm, w warmer conditions and cooler conditions and fluctuates uh, something like with a time scale on the order of 50 or 100 years, roughly. 
Then the example on the right, uh, we've given it the term Pacific Decadal Oscillation, although I would say oscillation is uh, in quotes. We really don't have long enough records to determine with whether this is truly an oscillation or just part of a sort of random sequence of variability. But again, you see long, long periods of time where the ocean temperatures can be in a warmer state or a cooler state. Uh, and so this is kind of the background of variability upon which uh, we are um, changing the climate through uh, human intervention. And for the next 50 years, as I will show you uh, uh, in the next few slides, uh, in some locations in particular, um, uh, I'll show you results for North America, these uh, freely evolving fluctuations of climate are of the same uh, order of magnitude as the human-induced climate change signal at the local scale. And so that makes it uh, very difficult to, uh, uh, to pin down uh, changes uh, over a 50-year time scale to uh, one, either the free or the forced component. So of course, uh, just, this is just a picture to put us on the same page of uh, what, what, what are the agents that are changing our climate system um, uh, apart from the uh, uh, interactions amongst the atmosphere and the ocean. So of course we have uh, on the top here the anthropogenic uh, sources of uh, forced climate change, most notably the greenhouse gas increases and then uh, the burning of fossil fuels uh, associated with the uh, Industrial Revolution, putting um, soot in our atmosphere. And then, of course, we have also uh, natural uh, agents that force uh, our climate. And uh, we have changes, of course, in the solar uh, cycle, uh, how much uh, radiation our sun puts out. And then, of course, changes in volcanic activity, which can uh, induce uh, cooling effect, as we've heard in the last uh, few talks. So uh, what I'm going to show you now are a set of climate change simulations. These are the typical IPCC-type simulations. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is, uh, these are simulations that were done with uh, uh, the a model uh, that was uh, contributed to the last IPCC report, uh, <clears throat> the NCAR Community Climate System Model version 3. And instead of just doing one simulation for the future, as most of the uh, models uh, did, we decided to do a lot. And uh, we ended up with 40, just as a balance between our computational resources and the length of time that we could uh, integrate this model. So each of our simulations undergoes the identical change in greenhouse gases and sulfate aerosols. So the external forcing is identical. And the only difference amongst each of these uh, simulations is a small change to the initial state of the atmosphere. And you can think of this as this butterfly effect where the flap of a butterfly's wings somewhere in the tropics actually sets uh, the uh, climate system off onto a new course uh, just, just through uh, chaotic interactions. So, uh, each one of these uh, simulations could be the real world in the future. And I'm going to show you uh, two of the uh, uh, a more extreme uh, <coughs> uh, results here uh, from two of the simulations. So these are maps of the future change over the next 50 years in the air temperatures over North America uh, in the wintertime uh, for the, uh, over the next 50 years, as I said. And uh, run A and run B here. Uh, they are taken from this set of 40 runs. And uh, they look very different, despite the fact that they were both uh, forced uh, with the same increase in greenhouse gases. Uh, very big differences. In fact, uh, parts of the southeast U.S. actually have a uh, small uh, cooling trend. 
uh, despite that greenhouse gases are increasing, whereas Run B has uh, a lot of warming, uh, particularly uh, over uh, Canada and Alaska. So how can these be so different? <laughs> uh, this is uh, <clears throat> actually, uh, the reason is that again, we're seeing this superposition even over a 50 year time period, a superposition of the natural or freely evolving climate variability and the component that is actually forced by the greenhouse gas in buildup. Um, so I'm going to illustrate for you this partitioning uh, in any one of these simulations between the uh, greenhouse gas, the human-induced component, and the freely evolving component. And uh, the way that we uh, can uh, estimate the forced component is that we just simply do an average of these uh, temperature changes uh, over all of the simulations. Uh, so the freely evolving part kind of drops out because they're random amongst the different uh, ensemble members and we're left with a forced. And then if we subtract that from the total, that by definition uh, is the uh, component due to the freely evolving variability. So again, back to run A and run B, and here we have the decomposition into what was produced by the uh, greenhouse gas buildup. That's the panels on the far right, which are by definition identical for these two runs. Uh, they are the average over all of the ensemble members. And then in the middle, you have the, the, the part that's left over. So by definition, in these experiments, that's the part that the, that the uh, uh, climate system uh, has uh, on its own, uh, regardless of any kind of external forcing. So run A, you can see much of the United States in the absence of an increase in the greenhouse gases uh, shows a cooling over the next 50 years whereas run B shows a warming. And the magnitude uh, of that warming or cooling is given by the, the numbers here. And you can see that over the contiguous US, uh, the, uh, the amount of uh, temperature change uh, rivals uh, uh, that due to the uh, greenhouse gas forced component. So we can, again, just to reiterate, uh, the panels on the left could be our uh, true climate system. We're only going to get one, one shot at the future here, and it could be uh, uh, run A or run B, or of course uh, in between. So let me show you then an example for uh, another uh, variable of interest, uh, rainfall in the summertime. So on the right here, uh, run C and D. <laughs> okay. And uh, brown colors are indicating that the rainfall is actually decreasing in the next 50 years. And the blues and greens are indicating an increase in the rainfall. And you can see that, in fact, these two runs give an uh, almost opposite picture um, over the, the United States, despite the fact that the, uh, the greenhouse gases are increasing in both runs. So this just tells you again that the natural freely evolving component of climate variability on the 50 year time horizon can, be, can swamp the greenhouse gas uh, induced uh, change for this particular uh, variable, summertime rainfall over the United States. <clears throat> I'm going to skip that. Um, so another way to uh, portray this uh, graphically is to uh, show you the distribution of the trends uh, for a particular um, variable, in this case the wintertime air temperature. So these are the changes over the next 50 years of air temperature at these different locations. So I was recently uh, giving this talk in New York City, that's why we have the the particular uh, location, New York City, on the left here. And uh, each of these bars, that's just showing you the number of simulations of the, uh, of the 40 that were done 
uh, that had a temperature uh, change of a certain magnitude, which is given on the, on the horizontal axis. So for New York City, you can see a wide range of outcomes uh, in the change of temperature over the next 50 years, ranging from uh, zero degrees uh, all the way up to four degrees. And again, uh, this is because of the superposition of the natural variability and the greenhouse gas uh, induced component. For Canada as a whole, uh, in fact, the range is even a little bit uh, larger than uh, New York City, or about the same, I should say, ranging between two and six degrees C. Uh, the US, again, uh, quite a wide range of outcomes. And then importantly, uh, for the globe as a whole, there's almost no uh, uncertainty due to the natural variability. So global warming really is uh, a, true, uh, a true metric of uh, the greenhouse gas-induced signal. But when you go to smaller and smaller regions, you can see that the internal variability can, um, can be commensurate with the, um, the greenhouse gas-induced signal. So I only have a few minutes uh, left. And I probably uh, won't go into this, but our uh, work uh, on this indicates that the proximate cause for the spread in the temperatures here uh, is due to changes in the uh, uh, circulation in the atmosphere. So the, the flow patterns, lows and highs uh, that change over this 50-year uh, time horizon, and that is what is inducing this spread in the temperatures. So I'd like to leave you with this schematic um, uh, <clears throat> for uh, how I think we should um, think about climate change. Um, so of course, climate change, we think about um, a change in the mean state. This could be uh, average daily mean temperatures. It could be the maximum temperature. It could be the number of uh, hot, warm nights. It could be an, any, any, uh, any number of measures. And uh, the uh, buildup of greenhouse gases will induce a change in, the, uh, in this uh, mean state. But of course, we have uncertainty. And in this case, the uncertainty that I've been discussing has to do with just the, the, the consequence of uh, the physical climate system that likes to vary uh, on its own, even for these long uh, periods, uh, as long as 50 years. So we will always have this uncertainty. Uh, and uh, even if our models uh, continue to improve and we have better estimates of what the greenhouse gas emissions will be, be in the future, we will always have a certain level of uncertainty because of the internal variability. So I think that has to be a very uh, strongly worded uh, component of our discussion of how to communicate climate change. Thank you very much.